Friends, we have made it to the final morning. Uh, well done for getting to the end. Well, not quite the end yet. Uh, and thank you for your patient endurance. See what I did there. Um, just going to touch on two uh, very straightforward topics this morning. Uh, we're going to solve all the problems around Israel, and we're going to explore the pastoral practical implications of all this stuff for our life. Okay, that's probably a bit ambitious. We're not going to do all that. Um now, on the question of Israel, let's spend the first 10 or 15 minutes just talking about Israel, and I'm not going to solve the issues around the most intractable uh, political situation in the world today in 15 minutes. Um, just want to point out two things to start with. One is just my background. I lived in Israel in my gap year, and I've visited several times since and been on study tours and all sorts, and, and also had the privilege of, of meeting some key political figures in the process through the Anglo-Israel Association. Um, it's complicated. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm half Irish, and uh, I remember there was a, a program some years ago on the BBC uh, about the the troubles, and they interviewed a woman on the streets of Belfast, and she said, I have to be sure, if you're not confused, then you don't really understand what's going on. And I think that's probably true about the question of Israel as well. Uh, I'm, I'm also aware that a lot of people um, have very strong views and are quite invested in a particular view about the theological and eschatological significance of the contemporary state of Israel. So those are two reasons. It's complicated and people are very, have very strong views why I'm not going to solve all the problems now. But I do think there are some really important things we can say from Scripture, and in particular from the New Testament, which are often missed, but are actually pretty central to the, the issue and to the question of Israel and the church. And I just want to start with one observation or one question. Can you think of any clear text in the New Testament which says unambiguously, as part of our end times hope, our expectation, ethnic Jewish people will return to the land, to the, to the physical land of Israel? Have a think. I don't think there is one that in itself needs to make us pause and think uh, i often get into conversations with people and say can you give me a text in the new testament that points to israel returning to the jewish jews returning to the land and they go yes ezekiel 39 and then there's a little sort of embarrassed moment i go you do realize ezekiel 39 is not actually in the new testament and the reason why that's significant is because the question of return was a pressing one in the first century a very large number of jews lived in diaspora from the previous exiles, a huge community in Alexandria and northern Egypt, huge community in Babylon, large community of Jews in Rome who were expelled by Claudius and Buckles and that's a significant part of the background of the New Testament. So the question of ethnic Jews in the relationship with the land was was one that was in the air all the time. Secondly, a good number of the New Testament documents we have were written after the destruction of Jerusalem and the expulsion of Jews there. So again, it's not as if this question was not, was not a pressing one in the air. And that makes it remarkably striking. There's not a single text in the New Testament which says, and ethnic Jews will return to the physical land that we call Israel. So that's just, that needs to be our lodestar. That needs to be our sort of basic um, orientation around this. Now, I just want to go through a number of things. You've got them in your handout. You've got your handout today. That was great. And I just want to run through some things which I think point to how the New Testament views this question and why we really need to uh, challenge what's been called Christian Zionism, the idea that the return of ethnic Jews to the physical land of Israel is part of an, an end time scheme. And we can pick up other questions from this in, in the question and answer session. So uh, let me just share the slide and i just want to run through these points uh, and they are things that we just need to really take seriously as we think about this whole question the first is as we've seen from looking at daniel chapter 7 general seven thirteen, in relation to matthew 24 you know jesus favorite term of self-designation is one like a son of man the son of man the son of man came not to, not to be served but to serve and had, and give his life as a ransom for many marked in 45 um and we just need to recognize from daniel 7 in daniel 7 you have individual figures representing uh 
empires and nations. So you have these four beasts that emerge from the sea representing their corporate images, representing the empires that oppress Israel. And in response to that, within the vision in Daniel 7, 13, this corporate figure, one like a son of man, a frail human-like figure, not a beast, represents Israel. It's Israel who will be defended from oppression. It's Israel who will be exalted to God. It's Israel who will be giving an everlasting kingdom. And at, at least one of the things Jesus is doing by using this language of, of one like a son of man about himself is claiming that he is represents israel he is jesus is the future of israel and that's why the high priest tears his clothes and says this is blasphemy because jesus is claiming to be the one authentic embodiment of the destiny of uh, god's people the jews so that's just sort of a basic datum of uh, the new testament secondly again jesus makes these these quite clearly these claims about who he is uh in john um to 19 uh well for john 1 the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us he's using the language of the the tabernacle in the desert uh so jesus jesus is a tabernacling presence of god jesus is the temple presence of god uh destroy this temple and in three days i'll rebuild it he says in john 2 he's talking about his body but his body is the temple presence of god so again he's identifying himself with the thing at the center of the nation of israel therefore those of us who are incorporated into Jesus are part of that temple presence. Again, we find this language in Paul, we find it in Peter. So um, those who are now in Christ, Jew and Gentile, are incorporated into the temple presence of God, sitting at the heart of the physical, <laughs> physical people in the land. So this is, the, this is the meaning of the vision in Revelation chapter 7. That's why, that's why the, you'd have to look at the commentary just to see, explain this. But, but just in shorthand, the vision in Revelation 7 of this, this faithful remnant who is saved from judgment in the world are counted out as 144,000. So 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10, a square times a cube, which signifies in the symbolism of Revelation, the holy temple presence of god in the world that's us and that's why the new jerusalem is also a cube when actually god's holy temple presence comes and fills the whole of the, the known world the whole of the roman empire if you measure it it actually stretches from rome to jerusalem with john on patmos at the center of it and this is where so i'm actually just taking these slightly out of order. this is where we we need to just pay attention to the language that the new testament uses about uh, the people of god um so I'm just jumping ahead down to the bottom of the slide there. Where, where you, where, wherever you find the word in English translations in the New Testament, the word church, um, you need to, I, I shouldn't really suggest this, should I? You need to get a pen in your Bible, English Bible, and delete it. <laughs> and cross out the word church. The reason is that for us, the word church means something like Christians who are non-Jewish, number one, it means an institution uh, or a national church, and it usually means a building with a nice pointy roof and a spire or something like that. And that's a problem. That's why when I was in theological education, I prohibited my students from using the word church. It's totally misleading. In the New Testament, the word church, it, it translates ecclesia. And, and, and the word ecclesia had two back two uses. First, it meant in Greek context, it meant the gathering of citizens in the polis in, in the city to make decisions. So it was, a, it was a gathering of people. It's not an institution or a building, it's people, number one. Number two, ecclesia is the word used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament for the congregation of Israel, as the authorized version has it. All right. So the, the, the ecclesia is the people of Israel. So when the New Testament talks about the ecclesia, the church, it does not mean a non-Jewish Gentile institution with buildings. It means the people of God. And the, all the New Testament writers are very clear that we Gentiles, I, must, I don't know if we've got any Jewish believers amongst us, but we, I'm assuming we Gentiles have become part of the ecclesia of God, Israel, because we've been grafted in through the Gentile mission. That, that, that's, that's why Paul in Galatians 6.12, he says, greet the Israel of God, and he must there mean 
the Jewish and Gentile Israel of God, the new Israel of God, which is not just ethnic and small, but has actually been expanded because the grace of God in Jesus actually spills out over to, to all nations. This is precisely his argument in Ephesians chapter two, where he says the, the, the gospel of the good news of peace with God has been preached to those who are near Jews and those who are far off Gentiles. And the two have become one. So Gentiles have become incorporated into the Israel of God. It's not that the church has replaced Israel. It's that Gentile believers in Jesus have now been incorporated and without having to become Jews. That's why Acts 15 is really important. They've been grafted in to the Jewish entire, uh, uh, Israel of God. So the two have become one. And, and actually, that's the, whole, that's the whole structure of Romans. Romans, the beginning of Romans, Paul says, this is why Gentiles need to be saved because they're sinners. But also, this is why Jews need to be saved, because as the scripture says, there, there, is, there is no one who, uh, uh, ever, all have sinned. Uh, and therefore, the, both Jew and Gentile are saved by grace and incorporated uh, into the Israel of God. I think that's also why, going to my next point, that's why Paul repeatedly uses unusual language of in Christ. In Christ, we are in Christ. It's not language you find in the Gospels, obviously. It's not language you really find outside Paul's letters in the New Testament either. But, but it seems to me that Paul uses the language of in Christ in the same way the Old Testament uses the language of in the land. When you're in the land of Israel, you are blessed by God but you're also obliged. You, you, you inherit the blessings that God gives to his people in the land, but you're also obliged to take on the obligations of obedience to God. And these things go together. And in fact, the blessings and obedience of being in the land are now the blessings and, and obligations of those who are in Christ. Now, those of you who are familiar with the discussion here will come across and say to me, ah, Ian, but what about Romans 11:26? The reason why um, you're tempted to say that is because in Romans 11, 26, as many English versions have, um, Paul's talking about the hardening of Israel so that the gospel is preached to the Gentiles. And then it says, and so all Israel will be saved. And many people have interpreted that to mean, OK, so the Jews are hardened until the full number of Gentiles come in. And then Paul's phrase, and so all Israel will be saved, means, ah, when all the Gentiles have been saved, then the hardening will be removed from Israel and all Israel will uh, then turn to Jesus. So therefore, that's part of, of, of Jews returning to the land of Israel and then the gospel being preached to them. Unfortunately, unfortunately now there is a long scholarly debate about this, but the bottom line is the grammar does not support that. Um, we're inheriting the authorized version here and the authorized version uses the word so and it means something different from how it means in it means something different in 1611 than it means today actually what paul says there is in this way all israel will be saved that's what the verse means and i think along with tom wright and other scholars i think that that the only re the only plausible way to understand that is that god's vision was that his Israel, his people, shouldn't just be ethnic Jews, but should in include people from every tribe, language, people, and nation, Revelation 7, verse 9. And so actually, the hardening of the Jews and the preaching of the gospel of the Gentiles is the way in which all of God's Israel from all his children in every nation will be saved. And I come back to my final point. <laughs> there is no expectation of ethnic Jews returning to the physical land anywhere in the new testament and the reason is not because israel has been replaced but because israel has been expanded and because the israel of god finds its fulfillment in the person of jesus as paul says in one corinthians that all god's promises find their yes in jesus and i'm just going to um stop the screen share here and um just note the way that the new testament transforms the understanding of who god's people are so in the old testament if I can put it like this, Israel was saved out of all nations. So in other words, the people of God were ethnically distinct and were physically distinct, and they were saved out of all nations. In other words, they were separated from all nations. The vision in the New Testament is the people of God are saved out of all nations, out of every nation. Do you see the difference? The difference in movement. It's not about the people of God being being separated and being corralled together in one particular place with a boundary around them. It's actually now 
that the people of God are saved out of every nation. There are people who are saved out of the French, people who are saved out of the uh, British, or the Irish, the Americans, the Chinese, the Africans, the different, all the different countries in Africa. So, so that actually the New Testament, the God's grace in Jesus in the New Testament, just it turns inside out misunderstandings in the Old Testament. In, in fact, it was always God's intention that ethnic Israel should be a light to the world. And in Isaiah, we find this vision that all nations will be drawn to Zion. And that finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Not that Jews from all nations should leave their nations and come to uh, physical Zion, but that we from every nation should be drawn, as it says in Hebrews, to the heavenly Zion. And the, the fact that there are Christians in every nation, followers of Jesus in every nation, members of the Israel of God in every nation is actually a fulfillment of that. And again, that's precisely what we find in Acts 15. The Gentile mission is the fulfillment of the biblical end times hope that, that all nations will come to know Yahweh, the God of Israel. I'm sure that's raised lots of questions for you and we'll pick those up in the Q&A. I think those are the key elements of what we need to understand. So let's finish by asking the question, why, why, why does all this matter? Why does all this matter at all? Uh, and uh, I want to start by going back to a diagram that we had earlier, uh, which is this. Let me share the screen again. So this is the diagram we had when we talked about the two ages right at the very beginning. The reason why we need to get all our stuff understanding about end times and the end of the world and eschatology right is because I think this diagram represents the basic configuration of how the New Testament understands what it means to follow Jesus. It means you leave the kingdom of this world in terms of your values and your understanding and your outlook, and you've, you've left that realm and you've moved to the other realm. Now, that's, a, that's basically, and this, this stuff about the two ages or the two realms is basically an apocalyptic outlook. Christianity is essentially an apocalyptic religion and many people find that difficult to get hold of well they find it a bit distasteful i was at a conference with john j collins who's probably world's leading academic authority on apocalyptic over the last few years and, and what's interesting is that we, we were both giving papers at the conference and he gave his paper and said well this is what this is what the apocalyptic worldview is and um i think his description of it was quite fair and then he said it's not very nice and it's not a kind of place i'd like to spend much time I just wanted to say to him, oh dear, <laughs> if you're a follower of Jesus, this is, this is the, the place that you occupy. Um, Christianity is a revealed religion. When Jesus at uh, Caesarea Philippi says to his disciples, who do people say I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter says to him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus' reply is, says, oh, bless you, son of Sabarjona. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but this is revealed to you. This is revealed to you. Revelation <laughs> by the Father. Christianity is a revealed religion. And part of the revelation is that we live in this age, but there is an age to come. And that's what our, our hope is. And churches like the Church of England, who've got a heritage of Christendom, they find this very difficult to come to terms with. Uh, and the idea that actually the community of faith uh, and discipleship means a decisive discontinuity with culture around us and the world around us, I think the Church of England really struggles with. But I think it's quite, it's not the only way, you might have discussed this before. There, there are ways in which looking at the wisdom literature, we also want to see continuity between this age and the age to come. But so it's not the only thing, but this is, this is pretty important and pretty basic. So um, let's just, I just want to give some headlines on why I think this stuff is also um, really important. Sorry, I've got my slides in the wrong order here. Let me put, let me get back to where we are. Uh, okay, there we go. So I've talked about the central, this, this, this understanding of this age and the age to come is central to our understanding of the cybertrack community and mission. I, I do think there are a lot of people who are unnerved by all this sort of end time speculation. Now, some people are genuinely unsettled by it. And I have conversations with, with people for whom this is a real problem. 
I think others are just baffled and they don't know how to respond. And I think that actually some simple engagement with what the text of the New Testament actually say can help to diffuse this frustration, this uncertainty, and actually give people uh, an answer. We talked about Israel and the land. And again, that's another thing where people expend an awful lot of energy and end debates. And I think actually just looking at some of the basic dynamics of the New Testament can really help us clarify that. Um, I think there's some, a, a number of really important par practical and pastoral issues. Um, the question of suffering and healing and answers to prayer. And that's particularly important for those of us who've been nurtured in the charismatic tradition. Um, what do, should we pray with confidence that people will be healed? And what do we do when our prayers are not answered? Now, that's a big old complex question. And, you know, we could spend a lot of time just on that on its own. But it seems to me that in order to make sense of this, our basic orientation needs to be we live in the now and the not yet of the kingdom. Yes, the, the, the kingdom of God, by the power of his end time spirit, has burst into our world. And we have a foretaste of the glory and the hope and the healing that is to come. Therefore, we should pray in confidence. But we also pray knowing that whatever healing, whatever, whatever remarkable signs of the presence of God we see, we still live in this age and each of us will die. It's interesting, isn't it, to reflect that Lazarus, who was resuscitated from the grave as a sign and a pointer to Jesus's resurrection life, he died. He died and was buried again. So I hope they, they kept that very for him. And whatever healing and whatever miraculous signs we see of God's presence and hope and love now, and we do long to see that, and we do expect to see that, these are just a sign and a foretaste pointing to the hope that is to come. Um, on the question of social reform and transhumanism, which might be an unusual word uh, for you, um, should we engage in uh, active work to see our society transformed. If you think that the kingdom has not broken into the present and it's only about the future, you'd say, no, there's no point. It's all going to burn. If you think that the kingdom of God is completely realized in this age, then yes, everything hangs on this. But then you've got no surplus of hope for the future. If you actually recognize that we live in this now and not yet of the kingdom, yes, we strive to see change. We long to see God's will done. We long to see his kingdom come breaking into the present. But we do that again, knowing that our hopes and aspirations won't be fulfilled completely until Jesus comes again. But when we do see signs of transformation, when we do see social reformation, so many Christians have been pioneers in, in driving social change and transformation so that we, we see an end to slavery, we see an end to child exploitation, we see justice in the workplace, and, and we, see, we see the environment cared for. These are not an end in themselves, but these are pointers to um, a greater reality. And transhumanism is a movement which sees no limits on human achievement, and there are people, particularly in America, of course, who, who want to see our bodies enhanced by technology so that we could transcend our limitations, perhaps even transcend death. Christians say, well, that, that's a kind of eschatology. Christians say, no, the hope of transformation is found in Jesus and will be realized at his return only. Finally, how do we think about death and how do we think about our postmortem destiny? And this comes back to things we talked about in the previous sessions. Um, in the end, the Christian hope for the future is our bodily resurrection that we will reign with him on earth forever in a transformed united heaven and earth together and that's the vision of revelation 21 oh i've got some questions for your discussion as well sorry i need to give you those let's go back to the screen okay let's reflect about this uh, and then we'll have uh, the q a session uh, later this morning so questions for reflection so you might want to think about you want to share what has been your understanding of the theological importance of the modern state of israel up till now and you might again want to say to me ian paul you are a fool <laughs> that's you wouldn't be the first and i'm sure you won't be the last either but you might want to reflect on any new insights and questions that just my brief summary of some of the the, the key issues here has raised 
And you might want to reflect together and, and from, from today, from things earlier um, in the week and say, where do you see the most important pastoral and practical applications of thinking well about eschatology and the end times? The questions are on your handout, but you also might want to just pause the video and uh, reflect on those. For those of you who are watching this video, not at Lee Abbey uh, in this week, but uh, later, then just a reminder that you can share the video if you think it's useful and uh, the buttons at the bottom there. And if you want to keep in touch with things on the channel, then click the subscribe button as well. Thanks very much.